Uh, when we started uh, with robotics uh, more than 20 years ago, and uh, I was one of the pioneers in this field, and uh, clearly there was uh, a revolutionary change, uh, not relying anymore simply on human capabilities, but kind of an alliance between intelligent machines and human minds. Everything translates into a better operation that we could define uh, the dream operation without collateral damages. The mission of the lab is dual. Uh, first, uh, to serve uh, for the education and training of the new generation of surgeons that is based on artificial intelligence, uh, technology, robotics, uh, virtuality, simulation. So in terms of training, we provide training for our resident and then at the UIC, not only just for our department, the Department of Genetic Surgery, we also provide trainings for residents from uh, urologies, Department of Neurology, and as well as residents from our affiliated hospitals. The other goal is to uh, support the research in this field. We're not only doing training research, clinical research, but we have very strong bench top research activities. So the last piece is actually the public education and, uh, and then community outreach. Um, like any other advanced technology, the public acceptance is critical. I think the architect that designed this space exactly uh, were able to translate uh, uh, my dream in reality. I remember our first meeting with Dr. Giulianotti when he said to us, we're not designing a space here, we're gonna be designing the surgeon of the future. And the conversation took off from that point. Dr. Giulianotti had a really some, some very visionary um, ideas about the environment itself. And he's a, he's a lover of art and appreciation of the visual arts. And he, he challenged us along the way, not only um, to bring light into the space, but that the space itself have a sense of movement. Innovation is all about invention, and invention is what makes art great. So whether it be music, literature, theater, film, any kind of art can mesmerize. A robot can mesmerize. We were charged with designing the most advanced, future-focused robotic simulation training center anywhere in the world. There are a lot of steps we had to take just in order to get this space ready for construction. The first time I saw it, I wanted to run. It was a combination of abandoned lab space and storage space. Uh, it hadn't been occupied in years. There were water leaks. It just, it really was not a pretty sight. The main challenges were just the age of the structure, the hiddens, the unknowns that we found when we dug into this lab, we found out utilities were shot and you know, we had to replace more than we thought. The first step we had to take was to get the place dry. The lab sits underneath the courtyard in between two towers in the Neuropsychiatric Institute, which was built in 1942. Over the years, the waterproof deteriorated, there were leaks outside, so we had to address that first. The next big hurdle we had was the ceiling heights. Uh, there's over 400 electrical outlets down here. There's 35 miles of electrical wire, 20 miles of AV cable. Now when you come into the space, you can really see that the, uh, the vision took hold. I mean, it's, it's everything we planned it would be. Because of the unique nature of, of uh, the concept, we had to remove ourselves from the constraints of the space that we were given, which is really a dark basement in a very old building. The most important part here is that we didn't jump into a design right away. We focused on designing an idea. We began extracting the DNA the components that would inform the design. So it had to be revolutionary, it had to be innovative, we had to be able to change it and also simulate how they perform surgery today. The inspiration for the project was really theater and theater stages where you can actually create any space in a very short period of time. And then when you're done with that play, you can rearrange it and create a different scenario. You've got the main performance space. That would be the innovation lab. 
and its two associated labs, the traditional surgical space and the experimentation research garage. Surrounding that space are support spaces. There's a gowning space, but there's also storage spaces. And these storage spaces are really what enable the adaptability and flexibility of this innovation lab. Garage doors open, glass doors slide open. The equipment can move in and out of this space quite easily through these doors and openings into the storage space so you can have multiple modes of use. We made some choices about materials and colors based on the convergence of nature and, and more natural approaches to medicine and then enhanced by technology. So we've used warm wood materials. We've also used shiny metallic materials, but they complement each other in general to create a warm environment. So we incorporated a green wall and this connection to nature, light, and the sky is very important to provide a, a warm, inspiring space for everyone that needs to work and collaborate here. They were able to convince the university to remodel the plaza. I brought to a meeting an image of the uh, pyramid in the Louvre Museum. And, and then we were like, oh, okay, what if we did that here? And we ended up with a similar solution, so you can actually see the sky from the dark basement. Yeah, I've been doing this just over 20 years, and I mean, this was the most challenging and I'd say most rewarding project I've been associated with. The lab is designed to have two purposes. One of them is for surgical training, and the other is for technology innovation. We actually strategically partner with Argonne National Laboratory, one of the star institute in the world in terms of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So Argonne's role in this uh, overall project is to, to collaborate on the AI and high-performance computing components and to bring that uh, expertise in large-scale data analysis and artificial intelligence to the collaboration that's trying to advance robotic surgery. AI over the next uh, 10 to 20 years is gonna become more and more powerful. It's gonna be able to control things. I mean, you, everybody knows about self-driving cars. We're imagining self-driving laboratories. Of course, we need to have a lot more research and physicians are always going to be making the final decisions, but uh, automating and simplifying uh, the processes from the physician standpoint is, is one of our goals. One problem that we think AI can help with is just improving learning curves. That is how long it takes for a surgeon to become proficient at using the robots. If we can use AI to define kind of a safety envelope around which the robots are aware and the surgeon is aware, we think that could also improve outcomes. I mean, we're just excited that uh, having the opportunity to couple our world-leading computing and AI capabilities with a world-leading robotic surgery center, that's a match that really can't be made anywhere else. The Department of Neurosurgery was founded back in the 40s of the, of the last century. So it has a very long tradition and the department has been uh, known to be excellent in, in surgical uh, training and patient care and in innovation. So the, this lab is a continuation of the, of the old tradition of the 20th century. So the technology that we're gonna be incorporating, the big data, the artificial intelligence, the surgical innovation, all of that is gonna to need to fit into the 21st century. We will provide training for resident when it comes to microsurgery, training on skull-based approaches, endoscopy, spinal surgery, instrumentation, as well as endovascular on large animals. So anyone who's doing microsurgery needs to have a microscope. And having microscopes in their lab is very essential so that people can practice on that. So when they go to the operating room, they develop that skill, which is the microsurgical skills. And I think it's one of the hardest things to do is to teach another resident. And you know, surgery is really a craft when you think about it. It's an apprenticeship. You can't learn this in a book. Yes, we read the books, we look at the anatomy, but it's really one-on-one -on -one teaching in the operating room. And I think when you finish as a surgeon in training, it can be pretty scary because you can't practice and practice on, on a single human being. But here in a simulation lab like this, we can practice, we can rehearse, we can do things in virtual reality. A big opportunity is in making simulators more lifelike, um, have them behave in a way that reflects real patients, uh, reflect more diversity of the patient population, 
and to challenge physicians in different ways while they're learning to use these systems. We have this incredible 3D digital imagery that allows us to actually interact with the 3D images that aren't even physically there. We could actually spin it, enlarge it, shrink it down. We could actually measure with such incredible degree of accuracy that we could never do before. So we can do actually precision surgery. Precision came about because of robots. No matter how good humans are, they just cannot be as precise. Within the lab, uh, we have an area for plastic surgery, uh, for additive and subtractive processes, which are gonna help support us both in the clinical and the, the research uh, areas. 3D printers uh, can be used in a variety of ways. We often use them in terms of printing guides and jigs to help us in the operating room. We can also use them for teaching purposes to better demonstrate the anatomy. So I think we're really going to have incredibly well-trained residents because they have a simulation lab like this. We really have the real technology where you can actually rehearse your patient the night before, like homework. Right now, their curriculum is to, to go to the operating room, to read in textbooks, to attend lectures. And infrequently, they have to go to the lab to practice. Up until your residency training, you've got somebody really senior to take you through. But that first day, that first week, when you're in there by yourself, it can be pretty scary because there's nobody there who's a senior can take you through. Beginning intern year, we start doing um, simulator training here in the lab. And in this scenario, the surgeon is no longer at the patient's bedside handling tissues. And so the robotic simulator lab allows an opportunity for the residents to learn how to use these minimally invasive procedures and figure out how to manipulate patients' tissues whilst not actually standing at the patient's bedside. I definitely saw the attendings doing a laparoscopic procedure or a robotic procedure and was like, that looks easy, I can do that. <laughs> like if they could just give me the instruments, I can show them that I could be just as good, maybe not as good, but I could be pretty good at doing that operation myself. Um, but the reality is when you actually get handed the instruments, uh, you fumble. The simulator lab essentially is like being in a driver's education class. You know, so you first sit down and you learn the basics, the rules of the road, how to respect the instruments, how to respect the patients while you're utilizing the instruments, how to position yourself in relationship to the patient and starting the operation. A student and a resident can sit down at the console and they can try an operation without having a patient underneath and being able to repeat the step of, of a perfect procedure without uh, damaging or hurting anybody. So in the laboratory setting, the resident learns how to translate what they're seeing on the screen to what they're actually doing within the, the patient's body. For very obvious reasons, it's best not to do that while you're actually operating on a patient. Training centers cannot be called a training center without a classroom. So our classroom will build on the same principle as our laboratories. Two key words, reconfigurable, adaptable. It can be combined all together, become an auditorium, or they can also divide it into small classroom. This entire lab space has an immersive audiovisual system that's accessible by people's personal devices, controlled on touchpads. Everything that is simulated can be captured down to cameras even in the robots. So there can be playback. And then sharing of this data and this visual information here locally at the lab, also in the hospital, we're connected to the hospital system, but as well as internationally. The place is designed in a way that it can provide training for any surgical specialty. We should be grateful to so many people uh, for, for this project. Uh, Dr. Fadi Charbel, uh, Chief of Neurosurgery, and uh, uh, Dr. Enrico Benedetti, uh, department head of uh, general surgery, but also uh, the chancellor Michael Amiridis, uh, the vice chancellor Robert Barish, uh, the dean uh, Mark Rosenblatt, and why not also the donors uh, like Bruno Pasquinelli that uh, with their generosity they made this really project uh, uh, doable. I've been very fortunate that I've been put in a position where I, where I could contribute and to start out with the kernel of an idea and see this at the end, is, it's just fantastic. He thinks of all these projects and I get to come along. 
Um, this is a very exciting one. And uh, I was here the first day, uh, and uh, it gets more exciting every day seeing the equipment and everything that it will be. The reason we get involved is the research and innovation helps a hospital save lives. And that's what I'm about. I want to save a life, 10 lives or 100 lives. This hospital has changed tremendously in the last 15 years. It, it can't, it's, it's undescribable how it's changed. They want to innovate, they want to help, they want to cure, they want to work. You can see it in their face and you can see it in their eyes. That's all I need. The technology that we had 20 years ago would not be the technology that we need 20 years from now. We want to be able to have this place where we can actually use it in the future and still be meaningful and still be something which is cutting edge 10 years from now and 20 years from now. There are four factors that make the SITL unique. History, location, technology, and the feature of the laboratory. If you have a lab like this with so many capabilities uh, to support many robots, both in training and in research, it's gonna give UIC just a massive advantage in this space. Um, and we don't know of anybody else that has a comparable facility. We're really bringing the, the state-of-the-art technology in many different areas of surgery um, right here uh, within the walls of UIC. I actually went to medical school here at UIC, and I wanted to stay because I saw the value that the institution put in its learners, whether they were medical students or whether they were residents. I really appreciated the academic rigor that the institution um, prided itself upon. And in surgery specific, I really felt that the attendings had an invested interest in each resident specifically. And I think by having this investment that they did, and it's not, I mean, the financial is a big piece, but it's not just the finance, it's the idea of building something like this. It's an incredible space. I mean, and really, honestly, we, I owe it to Giulianotti and to Benedetti. They built an absolutely beautiful, beautiful space here. It's gonna be fun for me to be here. Dr. Giulianotti is focused on advancing the art of surgery, and, and this will be the space where it actually happens. We are coming from a history of centuries that are uh, uh, limited uh, by the human capabilities. So only using artificial intelligence and computers, uh, we can go beyond and uh, we can achieve uh, the dream operation uh, that could be so selective, uh, anatomically, artistic, uh, um, without uh, collateral damages and, uh, and patient able to go back home uh, after a big operation in a few hours. On a scale of one to 10, how excited are you about the lab? Uh, in a scale from one to 10, I'm excited 11. <laughs>